I want to say a big welcome to everyone. It's very close to Christmas. I know that we're very, very busy, but I owe a huge thanks to our two incredible speakers who are going to join us this evening and to say thank you very much for doing this when we're on the run up to Christmas and finishing our 2023 online forum series with such a bang. Tonight, I am delighted to be joined by both Mary and Shingai, who both work at the Edinburgh City Council. Um, and they're going to talk tonight on a topic I think we don't talk about often enough, but I know that they do and the team does such great work in this area. So tonight's forum is entitled Family Learning ESOL, Responsive Parental Engagement for Resettled Refugees. What a whopper of a title. I am so looking forward to this. So the usual housekeeping, everyone, if, if we can stay muted while our speakers are uh, sharing this evening. Um, it helps with everybody's sound quality, but please feel free to use the chat or pop your hand up, which I will monitor throughout the session. Um, there will be space to uh, ask questions and share your thoughts with both Shingai and Mary, probably towards the end of tonight's uh, presentation. Um, and so let's move on and let's not listen to me anymore and listen to both Mary and Shingai's talk this evening. Thank you both ladies, it's great to have you. Thank you. I Thank can't you. hear Thank you. I hear you now. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. I'm sorry, people. I'm working from my phone. I'm hoping my laptop will be fixed and it'll come back to me. So bear with me. <laughs> but thank you so much for having us. I always love to come along to forums and the conference. So thank you, Pauline. Okay, so the resettlement program. Um, so we're part of a lovely team and um, our coordinator is very McNeil. She was supposed to be here today, but she's away. And we've got Mary stepping in. So Mary is our family learning tutor. I'm Shingai Mpunswana Maramba, and I coordinate the family learning part of the resettlement program around Afghans and Syrians. You'll notice from the system, we've got Hannah. You might know her already. She's part of Natekla, and she's, she's the one who's doing the PowerPoint. And she's also our ESOL project worker, and she does a fantastic job just overseeing the ESOL classes. We've got Agata Wozni. We didn't invite her to this part. She looks at the Ukrainian side of things and it's a big project. So in the sense, I thought at some point, maybe Pauline could invite her and she could give a glimpse into what she does because that's a, a solid piece of work. And our manager, Alan Stewart. Next slide. Thank you. So what do we mean by family learning? So family learning encourages family members to learn together. So most of our work is about finding opportunities for families to come together and learn with their children with a focus of intergenerational learning. So appreciating where they've come from and how they can bring it forth for their children. So family learning activities can also be specifically designed to enable parents to learn how to support their children's learning. So quite often we spend time in school to find out about the curriculum, what they're covering, what topics they're looking at, and just, and then going back to families and explaining it to them in, you know, in just simple language or just helping them to understand the curriculum. Because quite often we're working with parents who've come from other countries. In this case, we're working with refugees who've come from different countries of Afghans and Syrians. And just now we've got other Sudanese and Somalis who are coming in. So the education system will be totally different from ours. So we take that opportunity to help them understand what family learning is and work with schools. Next. So for me, I like to look at family learning on two levels. So I tend to see it on these two levels. So the top being the most visible family learning. So more about information giving. To me, this is the beginning of, you know, just the, the beginning of that journey into deeper engagement, a welcoming of sorts for parents to be part of their child's learning, a starting point, opening doors and inviting parents in. Unfortunately, sometimes this is as far as it will go because of resources, space, stuff, you know, not having enough staff members, or time. That's what we found that sometimes it's not always at the top of the agenda, but it's, you know, when 
I look at the next level, which is the deeper level, is the part that usually that's usually not so visible to the eye because it's when the families are invited in to take a seat and have a cup of tea over more, you know, more informal conversation when you're able to draw from the parents and finding out more about where they're from, what they're about, valuing their inputs and appreciating what learning they're supporting at home and empowering them to carry on. So that usually doesn't happen on the top level because usually those are one-off events where you meet parents and they get to see you, but you don't get a chance to actually have that time to build the relationships. So those are the two levels that I tend to look at family family learning. Next slide. I'm sure most of you would have seen this. So Education Scotland, this is really tiny for me. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's for Education Scotland, it's about trusted building relationships. So taking that time to get to know each other and building that lifelong relationships where we can start off by just talking about what curriculum or what subjects people are covering in school, but we can go deeper into finding out about what would you like to do? Where can I stop about deeper things that they're going through that they need help with? It's about being responsive to their needs. For us in our team, it's about listening. We, you know, taking the time to actually listen to what it is the families are looking for at a particular time. So you'll find when Mary starts to talk that we've been quite responsive and we've taken time to go and speak to people and find out their interests, what their backgrounds were like. Okay. Hold on, please. Hold on. Sorry. Is it working? So just to back up a little to what Shanghai was saying there, the another thing we found with our families is that um, they, they can move on very quickly and very suddenly, especially the families that have been living in hotels. We might be doing one-off sessions with them, which lead to a series of sessions and then particularly over the summer, when the, their stay in the hotels was coming to an end, we would go back week after week. And every time we went back, there was less and less families there because often when they moved, they had very little warning of it either. And so as we were building up these relationships with them and getting to know them a bit better, um, they just suddenly went with, without much of a chance to say goodbye. So, but you just have to carry on. You just have to carry on. You you have your remaining families that you can continue the sessions with. You have to plan each session. Um, so it, it, the sessions sit on their own. Yes, you can do something that will encourage learning over a series of weeks but each session has to be standalone. So the families that don't make it back next week or can't attend regularly um, will feel that they've got a lot out of that session anyway, and they're not going to feel that they're missing out on anything. Um, we, we do like, for, some, for a lot of our learners, we do like to give them certificates of attendance, for example, and that's a really nice thing to do at the end of term. In fact, we've got one next Friday when we're going to give certificates to not only our language learners, but our learners who've attended a lot of our groups. Um, and we do try and encourage everyone to come back together then. A lot of our families have ended up not even in um, Scotland, they're in England, they're, some of them are out, out with Edinburgh, so we don't always get a chance to, to uh, keep up with them and find out what they're doing. Um, but we do occasionally bump into them around the streets of Edinburgh and then it's very nice to catch up with them. They always remember us um, and you always get invited to their house for a cup of tea. <laughs> are you back with us, Shingai? It'll be interesting to see if Shingai's laptop is actually working or not. Um, what we can do, Hannah, if we go on to the next slide, and I think this is something, right. So this, I'll read this out. Some of the most vulnerable refugees are settling in Edinburgh under internationally agreed resettlement schemes. 
So family learning obviously are just a very, very small part in, in this whole process. Already the families have to go through the home office, they have to go through various things with other council departments. So we we see them, they might have just literally just arrived in Edinburgh that particular week. Um, and they've seen a lot of official people, they might have seen doctors, they might have been having vaccinations, they might have had to register with job centres or speak to people from the home office. And then we get to come in and do something which is much more relaxed and much more informal um, and on a much more friendly level. But even with that, it, it can be quite hard for the families to to understand what we're doing and to sort of relax and enjoy what we're trying to offer them. So it can be quite a slow process. And of course, within that, you might have like very tired children, very tired parents, people who are still not quite sure what's going on. But even at the start, it's worth making those connections and worth going to talk to people and even introducing yourself and saying hello and offering a friendly smile. Um, it can sometimes just help to, to be a bit more welcoming and a bit less, a bit less strict and a bit less formal. It was quite hard, especially in lockdown, when we had a lot of refugees over. And we were going into places like hotels and everyone was wearing masks and having to be very careful like that. It is very hard in those situations to, to smile and be friendly when people can't even see your face. But we persisted. And some of those families that we worked with initially, we managed to keep in contact with over the years. Unfortunately, a lot of them were in hotels for a very long time. But because of that, we were able to engage with them continuously. And as it says here, family learning offer ethical, reflexive and socially responsive approach to building supportive relationships with families whilst considering their needs and views, including cultural views and their expectations. So again, this is very much a two way thing. Um, I, speaking for myself, I was completely ignorant of everyone else's culture, of the different languages they spoke. Of course, they're equally ignorant, a lot of them, of our culture um, and how our society works. And as Shungai said, our schooling system and everything like that. So learning is very much a two-way process. Shungai, are you back with us? Do you want to say anything else on this one? Yeah. No, I'm back. No, you've covered it. Responsive, <laughs> I think, because of the nature of family learning, where a school cannot respond immediately by placing a child into school or we can't put them into an English class. We are so quick, whether it be by going in with some storytelling and or just going and making that initial contact because we're that flexible with the way we approach family learning and it's very down to earth. So no, Mary, you've covered it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Shingai, if you take this one, then I'll do the next one. But as as you'll know, I mean, very strong. It speaks, yeah, very strongly. So it says, we wanted to rebuild our lives. That was all. We lost our homes, which means the familiarity of life. We lost our occupation, the confidence that we are of some use in this world. We lost our language, which means the naturalness of reaction, the simplicity of gesture and the unaffected expression of feelings. So that just says a lot. We're, we're meeting up with people who've come from war-torn countries and their, you know, their journey to come here has been really traumatic. And in an ideal world, you want to welcome them, place them in a home, give them a school and just, you know, let everything fall into place, but that's not the reality. It doesn't work like that. We want them to attend school, but they've got other things that they prioritize. So 
where you want them to, to attend the class, they may be thinking I'm going to go to a doctor's appointment or I'm going to a housing officer. So learning is very much disturbed. But what family learning offers is that flexibility of saying, okay, you can, if you miss today, we can still catch up next week and we'll always catch you up. You're always welcome. It does, it's not closed just because you didn't come. The trauma, the tr I mean, we've experienced quite a bit where, you know, it's 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 unexpected. Sometimes it hits people a year later. Sometimes it just takes you, you know, tapping into a subject or just little things. I mean, right now with the war that's happening, it triggers. So things happen that can just trigger it and people get emotional. So which means even your lesson plan can 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 change because if people have just experienced an earthquake in Turkey and they've got relatives there, that's what they want to talk about in a class. You know, they they're not in the right frame of mind for you to carry on with the class. Health issues that maybe came, what they came with, maybe developed as on their journey here. They've got appointments to the doctors, language barrier. That's why we've got the ESOL classes, but the journey is slow and it's individual. It's not everybody who's learning at the same pace. Some people are struggling with formal class, the formal structure of just sitting in class. And so they need to be doing things whilst they're learning and the education system and quite often we've met people who've not had the benefit of going to school so you are starting from fresh you're starting from you know from scratch and start yeah and housing they were staying in hotels not ideal i mean you think going for a hotel in a week it's fun it's something different but when you find yourself staying there for two years it's 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 not nice it's not your space there's just and uncertainty about it. And then when the housing comes, you're being given options of going to different locations. So there's that fear of being, I've built a relationship with the families here. We are a community and now we are being displaced and we're being sent to different. So people are affected in different ways. Employment, quite often we've spoken to people and they talk about their backgrounds. You're meeting up with judges, lawyers, you know, people owned hotels shopkeepers, seamstresses, people who had who were working actively, but because of language and they can't just step into what they did back home and the weather. Even I, I mean, I've stayed here for 23 years and I still struggle with the weather. <laughs> I want to hibernate. I want to stay in when it's winter. So you can imagine that this is different from their sunny place coming to this cold to play so it's 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 getting them into that routine so mary will speak some more because we she will explain more about you know the support that we give to people who, do, who don't necessarily want to come out when the weather is like this or they've got other yeah other issues so these are some of the groups that we offer through family learning um, so we had lockdown school, political literacies, sewing and English, walk and talk groups, women's group, crochet and English, cooking and English, men's group, the young girls youth group, storytelling and crafts for families, internet safety workshop for parents. And within the mainstream family learning, um, in nursery, the family learning ESOL, which again deals with transition into primary, storytelling courses and events, family learning English with board games, all about maths, primary transition and book gifting events. So the, the sessions that we do, the, the sessions that we do, these are more the ones on the left. So this might be... Um, ongoing lessons or a block of 10 weeks during term time. So before I go into some of these in a bit more depth, I wonder if you could put in the chat, what do you think the participants might be getting if they attend these groups? What will they be getting out of the groups? Because obviously I know what we are trying to deliver to them. What do you think they might be getting out of them? Yeah. 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 All these things. Meeting other people. Yeah. Yes. A safe place to practice English. Definitely. 
yeah, making connections with other people, fun, socialising, yeah, definitely. Yes, all of these things. You're exactly right. So it's it's not just all about learning. As you know, it never is. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, building confidence, not just with your English practice, but with some of the things that Shanghai was talking about. You've you've lost your your home language, your way of communicating and expressing yourself. You've lost your career, your livelihood. Um, to, to find yourself suddenly unemployed like that and not able to, to do your work, which contributes to your self-esteem. And, you know, if you were a housewife, not even able to go and make a cup of tea or wash your own clothes because you're stuck in a hotel, not able to do your cooking, which you would normally love to do at home. All these things are missing in these families' lives at the moment. So through through our family learning, we try to support the families in being able to, to do these things again and to have these safe places where they can do these things. So some of the groups that I've been involved in, um, for example, the Sewing in English group, this group was something that came about because the ladies had talked about uh, attending a sewing group with a another organization they were saying how much they enjoyed it so we thought right we'll we'll offer them a sewing group and through that we discovered that several of our ladies who had no English at all and were very shy about joining in were very accomplished seamstresses and actually worked like that in their home country many of them were parents to seven, eight, nine children and made all their children's clothes themselves. Um, and the group started, I think, quite small and has grown. And of course, again, we've lost a lot of our ladies through moving away, but more of them have joined. So we made up this little booklet to, to help the ladies practice their English. So this is a booklet and there's also flashcards of it, which we use in the class to encourage the ladies to learn these things. A lot of these words are ones that even I wasn't familiar with and I do actually sew. Um, parts of the sewing machine, you know, if you've never sewed before, these things can easily seem like a different language. But the ladies are so confident in what they're doing and because it's something they enjoy doing, they very quickly pick it up. And within this as well, it's fun to learn, it's fun to learn the, the words that they use. Um, pantalon, pantaloon, this word crops up everywhere. It's trousers in so many different languages. Things like when we were doing their measurements, we were able to ask them, do you use inches? Do you use centimeters? That generated a whole lot of conversation as well. And just to watch these very quiet, shy ladies coming alive and doing their sewing without any patterns and any measuring it is, it is wonderful to see, actually. And another very nice thing about the sewing group was it encouraged a lot of older ladies to come along. In the hotels, we didn't just have families with young children. We had some quite older generations, obviously, grannies, um, and a lot of the time their their children or grandchildren would translate and say, oh, you know, my mum doesn't want to learn English, you know, she just, she feels she can't do it. But then they would come to the sewing group and they would be very happy to pick up the words, different words for clothing, different words for colours. And then they would start attending their English classes and then start asking for more English classes. So that was that was great to see that. And as well as that, we also had days when they would bring their daughters in if it was an in-service day for school or if the schools were on strike, for example. And it was it was actually lovely for the girls to see their mothers in those positions where they were being successful and achieving and communicating because often the daughters were translating for the mothers but this time the mothers were very much in control and showing the daughters what to do and um, helping them to learn there as well. So this group has been running for oh, two or three terms I think and we're definitely going to continue it hopefully anyway because the ladies do enjoy it. We've managed to 
make contact with, we, we run it with, is it Remote Shanghai? Remote, yeah, Remote. Yeah, who are an organisation who um, sort of upcycle materials and furniture and, you know, if things are cracked or broken, they can mend them and make new things out of your old curtains or whatever. So we work with a woman from there um, and we've managed to get hold of sewing machines from various places that don't always work as well as we want them to. And also, yeah, thanks, Hannah. <laughs> Social enterprise also employs some refugees. I do get, I get very confused between remote and remakery. So thanks for putting me right on that one. Um, we get material from various places. We've taken trips out to charity shops and asked them where we where we're based in South Bridge in Edinburgh. There's oh my gosh, about eight to ten charity shops within walking distance. So about once a term, we'll take the ladies. We'll go around the shops. We'll ask if they have any material. Often the shops are more than happy to give us a big discount when they when they know what we're doing with the material. And it's also introduced a lot of the ladies to the joy of shopping in charity shops. So, yeah, this is one of our successful courses and is, it's very enjoyable and it's very fun. Can we go back to previously, please, Hannah? So another, another group that I've been involved with there is the women's group. And the women's group first started before lockdown and it's something we've always done with an Arabic translator. It's not always necessary to have a translator um, but in the case of the ladies who were only just in this country, we did find this was necessary. After, during and after lockdown, we've had to run part of the group online. Um, we do meet up, we, meet, we try to meet up about once a month or once every few weeks. We take the ladies out. They love to go out. The sessions we have when we go out are a lot more attended than the ones that we do online. Um, we've taken them to museums and art galleries. We've taken, we've tried to take them on all the different forms of transport, buses, trains, the tram. When the trams first started in Edinburgh, that was a lovely day out for us. We try to get them to buy their own tickets and look up timetables and just the sort of things we, we do, we take for granted and we do every day. But some of our ladies have never attempted this. We had one young woman who'd never been on a bus before by herself in Edinburgh, even though she'd lived here for at least two years. A lot of the ladies had never been on a train. They'd never attempted to even go into the train station. And once we did that with them, they were a lot more confident and then they were then able to go and do it on their own. We've taken them to various shopping centres. We ended up at the Guile one day. And one of the empty shops there was now home to table tennis tables. So everyone had to go at that. And it was the funniest thing to be involved in because, as you may know, the ladies, when they go out and about, they never take their coats off. So they were fully clothed, head scarf, so it must have been hot, coats on, buttoned up, handbags in one hand, batting this little ping pong ball about having the time of their lives. It was really great fun. When we meet online, we, we do many things. We like to support what they're learning in class. So we will often say to them, what have you been learning this week? Do you need any further support with it? And we try and do a little bit of that in the course. We've also done an internet safety workshop for parents, including putting parental controls on the television, um, putting a timer on the internet, finding your way around the phone, even very small things like that can have a huge impact. Some of these things the ladies didn't even know existed. I mean, some of the things I didn't even know existed until I started doing research for the group. Um, you know, how to block things, how to put safe mode on YouTube, all this sort of things. Um, we also found a site where you can practice your driving theory test in Arabic. So we supported one of the ladies with that and she went on to pass her test. Probably not because we helped her. I'm sure she could drive already in her home country. But again, it just gave her that bit of boost to do that practice and to do it with other people because the other ladies helped her and supported her as well. 
We've also made, we made a series of videos for um, the women's group to do with things like how to phone up and ask for an appointment to the doctor, how to change an appointment at a hospital, how to return things to a shop. Shingai, I'm not sure if you managed to find the video of that one. I found them, but I'm not, I'm now on my phone, so on your phone. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's fine because it was a very bad video anyway. It, we did it <laughs> with very basic Teams technology. Um, but what we would do is make the video, play the video and get the ladies to practice in the different roles. So they got to practice just copying our words and saying, I would like to return this um, and just practice talking to somebody else like that. I know that the, the English Snacks video that we have on YouTube that Hannah and the team made during lockdown have been wonderful and we do make use of these a lot as well and it's just all about giving the ladies the chance to practice. Again in the women's group it's been a great source for the ladies to connect and make contact with each other and support each other um, which they do very very quickly and we find that even if we arrange to meet up somewhere um, the other woman I work with, Siham, who is the language support for the women's group, she has all the ladies' numbers in their work phone and we say, right, we're going to meet here at two o'clock, phone me if you're going to be late. But very quickly we found that one of the women will ha soon have everyone else's phone numbers and the women will coordinate that within themselves and support each other with finding the right bus and giving directions and things like that. So again, that is lovely to see. We've recently started to talk more about cooking. When we've been meeting up, one of the ladies has been bringing her wonderful food um, and we've managed to get some recipes together, which I am going to try out at some point um, and share with everyone else. So if it's successful, if we do manage to put something together, I can certainly share it through here and you can all have a go at doing some um, Syrian and Afghan cooking because as I think we can all attest here at the council, it is lovely. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to speak about here is the storytelling and crafts for families. Now, this is something that we've often done during holiday events, for example, and it is a whole family event so it's for parents and children often we we will sometimes we do end up with just the mothers coming along the dads may come along and bring the families and then often they, you know they'll go away and have a little chat and the mums and the children stay so this one on the screen here this is one we actually did at the botanic gardens and we were given a room and a cottage to use um, and we did storytelling in there before we took the, the group out into the gardens and did little activities there that the staff had put on. So the nice thing about doing storytelling is you can use a lot of props. You can use a lot of body language and gestures. And we do include a lot of singing and rhymes as well. So even if you don't speak a word of English, it's something that you can always join in, join in with. Um, for example, if there's a song that has clapping in it or repeated movement, you know, the wheels on the bus and everybody enjoys it and everybody joins in. When the families are in the hotels, like Shanghai was saying, before they even had a chance to register with the school, we were able to go into the hotels and do storytelling and craft sessions in the hotels. Um, it was slightly problematic from the start because while we were saying it was family learning, the parents were only too happy to drop the children off in the room and then go off back to their own rooms or go and get a cup of coffee. But the children loved it. The children joined in very enthusiastically. They loved making the crafts. We would often give them extra crafts to take back to their rooms to share with their other siblings who hadn't managed to come down for whatever reason. And again, that was a whole series. So we were seeing them for six, eight, 10 weeks at a time. Um, and afterwards, the parents 
the parents did engage in a certain way because they would always come to us afterward and say, oh, my child enjoys coming here. My child enjoys making things. They would ask to borrow books. So we were able to put little packs together, little bags that had books and colouring pens in and I think some paper and various things that they could use themselves. So I don't know if you can spot this, but this this is actually me with very short hair in that photo there. So this has been going on for, we have been doing this for years. Um, yep, there's me. I think, is that you? Hannah. There, Hannah? Yeah. Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> with one of your not so young children now. So this is something that we've been doing for years and it's something the families keep coming back to. Um, and we've also managed to extend this to a storytelling and English course where the families, some of the families have come along and actually been able to learn a bit more about storytelling and look at developing their own storytelling. And of course, it's always lovely to hear them telling stories in their own language or teaching us songs in their own language or even teaching us verses in their own language. For example, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. You'll find this in cultures all over the world. And it's a lovely one to do in any language because you can just join the actions in as they come up. So I think that's all I've got to say about this for the moment, Shingai. Yeah, fantastic. So you'll see sometimes when it's holiday time, because we're mothers and grandmas, we bring our kids to it as well. And I think that in itself has got a richness to it because they get to experience a, you know, a variety of people in the groups. And yeah, it's nice for the social interactions. One more thing I would say very quickly before we go on to this next bit was um, about engagement. I was talking about the sewn group and responding to something that the ladies like to do. I was very aware that while they were in the hotel, one particular hotel, then they were moved to another hotel and then they came back to a hotel in Edinburgh and we managed to meet up with some of the families again. Um, and especially some of the some of the older women didn't really go out, didn't really like to even leave the hotel. And while they they were there sort of on the periphery when we were doing things, but it was obviously not something that they would necessarily do. A lot of people, you know, they like the colouring in, the cutting out, the making crafts, but it wasn't always something that the older ladies wanted to do. So one holiday session when we were getting all the families together, I decided that I would like to do something a bit different with them. And we had a couple of sessions where we painted and we made a very simple Play-Doh with flour and water. And um, poor Shanghai and Vary especially, who weren't really used to doing things like that in their sessions, were quite upset at the amount of time it took to tidy up. But the thing is, because we were making Play-Doh, and it's something that's obviously it's just flour and water, a lot of the older ladies loved to take part in that. And in fact, one lady who very rarely spoke or even smiled or looked like she was even wanting to be there, actually asked if she could take some of this stuff back to the hotel and try and make something on her own back there. So I felt that was a huge breakthrough. And um, despite the, the mess... Um, I really enjoyed that. We have we've never actually repeated that one, funnily enough, but I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah. I don't think we've got time for the all about maths part Ooh. of this. You know. We're at twenty two ladies. I don't know if that helps. Twenty two. Yeah. Twenty minutes. We could do it really quickly, Mary, but maybe go to the the, the chat. Rather than, I don't know if yeah. we can go into rooms. I think you're right. Come, we're too, yeah, so let's just do it together. So all about maths is, um, is something that we've done in schools. And it's looking at maths learning opportunities around you. So it's bringing forth things that parents are already doing with their children. So we, we, we invite the parents to come in to... Usually it's nursery, am I right, Mary? It's nursery parents who come in and will have maybe eight. And they will look at, so three sessions, they'll look at 
what learning can you can you do when you're in the supermarket? And they'll start collating that information and coming up with ideas of maths opportunities in the supermarket, in the community, and in the home. And what they do with what they've collated is we make booklets and they can share those booklets with with other families who could not attend. And that sense of pride of something that they've given back because you're bringing forth things that they're already doing, you know, maybe without even thinking about it. So it's just maybe reminding them that when you're cutting pizza and you you could have math language and how to share that, how you're cutting it into four for four, you know, and look, telling time with the clock or letting your child look at the bus number, look at the, what's that machine thing that tells you what time the bus is coming and doing the countdown. So it's just bringing forth, you know, maths that they're doing already or letting their children pay for shopping when they go to the supermarket, asking them what method of payment do you use? Everybody use cards. Is there a chance you could take out money and your child could pay and they could get changed so that you can have that conversation off the exchange of money for, for goods. So that's a, a lovely session and yeah, that we, we do as well. So do you want some feedback on this, Shanghai? We were going to ask. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> so if we could put in the charge room, what learning could you do in the supermarket? We start off with the supermarket. Matt's, Matt's learning. <laughs> Discounts, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I'm subtracting. Budgeting, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a nice yeah. one. That's a good one, definitely. But remember, maths just isn't about numbers, everybody. What else? <laughs> Apart from counting, what other aspects of maths might you find in the supermarket? I think about sizes, shapes, where things are. If you're reaching something higher, lower, You might have your very long carrots or your very short ones, your big tomatoes or your little ones, your round juicy apples. <laughs> yeah, all of these ones. Yeah, comparing things too. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, colors as well. Yeah, you want the big pack of toilet roll though. No. Two would do. <laughs> yeah, colour's not math, but it could be because you could have like five red apples and two green apples. So, you know, it still counts. It's still in there. Lovely. How about in the community? What maths learning opportunities can be found in the community? Yep. House number is my favourite, yeah. We had that in the hotel when they were talking about what door numbers they each yeah. lived at. Phone numbers, yeah, registration plates. Yeah, and this is something that the ladies do use a lot, these sort of apps, and then they'll work out, because they're not native to Edinburgh, so they're working out for the first time, is it quicker if I get this bus? Is it quicker to get that one? How long till the bus comes? How long will I have to wait if they're having to get a connection, if they're going to college or something like that? So they do make use of a lot of these technologies as well to work these things out. Yeah. These are all good. And the last one, what maths learning opportunities can you find in the home? Actions, yeah. 
peeling socks. I was going to sit that. I'm actually sitting beside the pile of washing at the moment. So yeah, that's a very good one. <laughs> as long as somebody's been hogging the tea. <laughs> I'm now wondering if Emma's got a chart in her house of how long everyone's yeah. allowed to use the TV for. <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah. <laughs> bedtimes, that's not fair. His bedtime's half an hour after mine, all that kind of thing. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. So you can see how that would work. It provokes you know, lovely conversations and people are just, you can see them having that ah moment and then they make the booklet and the sense of pride that it's being shared in school and it's being used. So it's a really nice little project to do with, with parents. And I think right now there's a push for numeracies. So quite often when I used to hear maths, I'll be like, oh, I was bad at maths. But once once I got this package and we could, you know, we could, we could do it, I was like, okay, okay, maths is not as intimidating as... <laughs> Well, it is on the high level, but when it's nursery and primary school, hey, you can make it fun. Yes. Yes, time tables, yeah. Time for break and lunch. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so just a quick one. I think we really... We enjoy our work, but I feel like sometimes, well, most times, to be honest, when you work in partnership with schools, there's there's something very valuable that comes out of it. Not only are the resources shared, the stuff, the ideas that come out of it when you're working in partnership with people is is really something to, yeah, to work for. It's, 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 it's really good. I think I highlighted the social work one because we hadn't been working with social work before until we were approached um, about a year ago, I'd like to say. And it was an, it was about unaccompanied minors. So we don't usually do, you know, work with, with youth. We've got a youth work department, but this came to us in a meeting where I had mentioned that we do family learning and we had talked about what family learning is. And the, the social worker was like, I've got some, you know, carers who might benefit from family learning. So we said, okay, let's try it. So these carers came with their young ones. And I think it was a group of eight, nine. This I delivered with Hannah. So that's also another partnership that came. So we're working with social work, but we've also got Hannah with the ESOL hat and me with family learning. So Hannah brought the ESOL part. I brought the fun games into it and it worked so well. It was such a success. And a key part of the success as well was we had a group of Vietnamese young you know, unaccompanied minors ranging 16, 17 year olds. And we had been running a youth group for the Afghan girls. So we decided to bring them together. And it just turns out that they were all going to the same college together. So friendships were formed before they went to college. And it was brilliant in encouraging people to use English within the session, because when we're just doing it with the Vietnamese children, they would tend, they'll gravitate towards speaking in their language. But once the Afghan girls were part of it, it just built friendships and it was such a success. So much so that we're about to run our second one, which is quite different in the sense that I think this one, we're going to work more with youth work because there's a growing number of unaccompanied minors, but they're in group homes, so they don't necessarily have an adult to come to family learning ESOL with. So we're going to try it with youth work so that we're still able to offer that English learning, family learning, and youth work. So I think there is such, yeah, such good work that can come from partnership work if you can, yeah, if you've got people to work with. Okay. Do you have any thoughts, any questions? Please feel free to pop your hand up or shout it out or use the chat box, whatever you prefer, folks. I have to say, from my point of view, some lovely, really lovely ideas and uh, ways of working with uh, families just I can imagine how joyful it must be for your workers to be part of those projects and to see 
if what seems quite simple ideas, and I, I'm not belittling them in the slightest, simple but genius ideas about how to approach people and work with them and create moments of joy, but also moments of learning at the same time, I think is absolutely it is. fantastic. It is, Paul. And, and what we found, to be honest, is that we've got such a rich team in the yeah. sense of, you know, what, they, what they've got, the knowledge and the the crafts you know you ask somebody you're like what's what do you like doing they're like i like crocheting and i was like can you can we do it into an easel can we include english oh yes we can and then yeah. you're tapping into what into what the tutor loves to do and you're saying let's bring some english into it go and deliver it and it's it's just yeah yeah brilliant yeah i mean for i'm even just a sewing part there i've just I've just done a little sewing course to re-familiarise myself with my sewing machine. And I'm just thinking, that would have been so helpful to have done it that way, just for me. Never mind your easel <laughs> learners, but for me. And to, to and so you can then see how really anything is possible. Any sort of social activity or craft or event is possibly made into a learning opportunity, which I think is really clever. I do say the richness of your team allows you to do that. That's smart. It's really smart. Well, it is good fun. The, the The groups are always good fun. And the important thing to remember is that you you have to learn from the learners as well. So it's, a, it's very much a two-way process rather than just us, you know, trying to instruct them and pass things on to them. We learn a lot from them too. Um, Shanghai, did you see the, the, have you seen any of these comments in the chat? Is there a website where I could find all info past people? In person, can we cancel? No, I guess you could get in touch with us because we're making up things as we're going as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mary's the one who designed that sewing. So we just respond and we work together. I go to Hannah and say, okay, we need English into this. You know, we just, so we've not created a sharing database, but we can share, you know, some some stuff that we've, we've made yeah are you happy to to put your maybe emails or give us an email that we can that people can use to get in touch with you into the chat Mary yeah, or yeah, I? Yeah. yes please Hannah or Mary I can't do it from my phone yeah mm -hmm. please that would be great shall I just put mine because I'm not 100% yes, sure what your yeah. one is yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hannah that if that's okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's fine Thank you. Does anyone else have anything? I just checked that there aren't any other questions. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, Gosha says families in Edinburgh are so lucky to have you. You're, it's true. It's fantastic. I think, I mean, I have to say, I don't think Family ESOL is done to your extent everywhere in Scotland. You're definitely what feels at the moment the most cohesive family ESOL programme in Scotland by far. We're fighting uh, the little corner. Do, yeah, do you work? Do you know or work with other family ESOL teams in Scotland? No, no, I'm yet to meet any of the you know yeah. places that. <laughs> mm. I'd never no. thought about that to no, be I've honest. Never thought of that because yeah. even the family learning ESOL course that we've got was designed by one of you know yeah. our workers and Mary. It's, you know, just by looking at the needs and just responding. And then they created a format of the eight-week course. So, no, but mm -hmm. it's all... And Emma's saying she's not yeah. sure there's one in Aberdeen. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that um, last year when you spoke at the conference, yeah. there was a lot of interest. Lots yeah. of people wanted were wanting to do something like this. But it, it's like you say, it's not necessarily a funding priority yeah. for... Yeah. Um, local authorities so that I, maybe that's the difficulty yeah um, quite possibly and even in one year since last year's conference the pressure on ESO funding has changed yet again hasn't yeah. it and quite often it becomes about those funding priorities rightly or wrongly it becomes about the priorities of what maybe the local authority is facing or the city yeah. council is facing yeah. Yeah. and I think our sorry to 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 just jump in but I think that the funding for the resettlement program that we did that the the family learning was built in to the to the the proposal so we've been quite lucky with yeah. that because it's part of the deal kind of thing okay. yeah. 
And I think right now they're trying to push that we're part of the PIF funding, hopefully, mm -hmm. so that it happens mainstream. Yeah. Because we, we are trying, Mary is now main, well, family learning East Soul, but covering more of Edinburgh, whereas I'm still working with the Afghans and Syrians. So now we're spreading that money and just looking at schools, because when you're in schools, you're targeting Afghan Syrians, but you're also having other families in it. Yeah. So we just clear the PEF money to just so that we can get more workers and more people to deliver. Yeah. 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 Great. Joanna, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask something? Yeah. But f firstly, just to say what a great presentation and um, I've come to this not because I do the, the family learning side of things, but because I'm working with some young people, um, mm -hmm. the asylum seeking unaccompanied children mm -hmm. and young people. Um, and it's it's being done really as part of their school timetable. Mm -hmm. So the C CLD as a CLD, we're providing that. Um, and this has been a, a brand new experience for me. It's not something that I've done before. And so I was, you know, just because I'd heard about this, I thought, well, I think I'm sure that there'll be some similarities somewhere. And there has been, and it's been really um, helpful, I think, to hear, for example, that when you're doing things on topics that they're interested in, the vocabulary starts to come really quickly. And that's what um, we have kind of found as well. So um, that's been really helpful to hear and just developing those kind of ideas. And something that we're going to start doing more of in this next term is going out and about in the in the the area where we live and just going with the young people so that you know they just build that hopefully that sense of self and place in yeah. in the in this area because what we find is that a lot of them are disappointed that they've ended up in such a small town you know they where, I think they where come, is it your base Joanna? Peterhead Right. Yeah. Okay. So, that. Yeah. That's a yeah, bit out so, there, isn't it? For yeah. Young and and, yeah. and they've actually had to move some of the young people that mm. were as far as Banff, for example, and, and move them down mm -hmm. to Fraserburgh or Peterhead, um, you know, for for these issues of the sense of isolation and that. Um. So just developing that sense of self and place is something that we want to just increase as well. Um. But I mean, even though we have just started from nothing, essentially. The young people that we had last year, they have most of them have gone on to college this year. So that's fantastic that they, you know, that their English did improve. And we will have just had a small part to play in that. But it's also um, a partnership really with social work as well. So with the school and with with social work um, and us providing that um, ESOL support on their on their timetable, but in the CLD approach. Um, so learning how to do that but learning with them and really letting them start to take the lead um has been probably the key um yeah right that sounds great that sounds exactly what we were talking about yeah that sounds lovely joanna well done yeah bit by bit oh bit that's, by that's, bit. that's all you can do I yeah i tell you i tell you something else as well um that quote from hannah arendt that you you had up on the slide where um, she says about, you know, we lost our language. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that was really disconcerting for me at the beginning is I felt like I'd lost my language as well because I couldn't use how I would normally communicate yeah. with yeah. people. And I just wondered, and listen, I know that that's a tiny minuscule um, comparison to how those young people are feeling you know in terms of everything that they've lost and and the way that they're having to rebuild again but I just wanted if any of you feel like that sometimes oh yes, and... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh yes yeah and I don't know I think my my mothering instinct comes in I was looking at this boy and he didn't have his coat on and it was a cold day and I just wanted to communicate to him and say where's your coat? You know, just go into that. And you're like, I, you know, yeah, it is. It can be frustrating because you just want to speak quickly and say what yeah. you want to say, but you, something is lost sometimes in translation and you're like, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I'm, yeah. I'm just learning bit by bit, like, like they yeah. are, but um, yeah, it was, it was, no, it, was just, no. it was just one of those little light bulb moments, you know, that it's not a bad thing that I was feeling um uncomfortable because actually this is how, these young people are feeling, but you know, much, much more yeah. pertinently. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. 
Does anyone have anything else they'd like to ask or add? We're just coming up for eight o'clock just now. Kasia's saying, I have a question about languages. Have you met families that were concerned about the children not learning their mother tongue? Yes. Mm -mm. Yeah. To an extent, not deeply, but I think it's, it's sometimes it's the opposite, isn't it? They they would rather they learn English. So you're trying to reinstate that your mother tongue is very important and bilingualism, you know, just support that. But Mary, maybe you? Yeah, this happens a lot. You know, we've even seen this with all the, the Polish families that we have. We've come to Edinburgh over the years. Um, and as because that is the advice we give the families, whatever age their children is, speak to them at home in their home language. They'll hear English everywhere. So the parents do this while wanting to learn English, but they do encourage their home language. Um, and then they will say, oh, you know, my, my child doesn't want to speak to me in my language anymore. Um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the especially with languages like Dari or Farsi, which I don't think there are a lot of Dari and Farsi speakers in the U well in Scotland anyway. Arabic, of course, is a much more common language. So the families that are speaking Arabic, um, they'll find it easier to get things like dual language books or like I was saying, our um, driving theory test in Arabic or subtitles in a film in Arabic. Um, but some of the other languages that the families are speaking, Kurdish, for example, there isn't a lot of support for them. And it is much easier for the children just to learn English and continue to learn English. Um, not, not all of them, I would say. A lot of them still will retain their home language. And all we can do is encourage the parents to try and keep it up. And then at some point, you will get a lot of the children turning and saying, ah, oh, you should speak Arabic. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Why don't you speak Arabic? And then they try and teach you their home language as well. Um, so, it, it, yes, it is something else you want to encourage. And that again, that is a very nice thing about a family learning group. When you are working with families together, with the children and parents together, they will talk to each other in their own language. Um, whether it's a craft or an activity or the sewing or the cooking, they'll speak to us in English and obviously we're speaking to them in English, but when they communicate together, they will speak in their own language. Mm -hmm. And it's lovely to hear them doing that and to, to see how they're expressing themselves and communicating um, at that level while still being in our environment. And that's obviously, that's something that we encourage too. Great. I don't think there are any other thoughts or questions and we're just past eight o'clock. So I'd like to close the session. Let's say a huge thank you to Mary and Shingai, especially Shingai having technical issues to begin with and having to come in on her phone. So then thanks to Hannah also for managing the PowerPoint. It's been phenomenal to have you. That was a really lovely presentation. And as I said at the beginning, and I knew it would, it would finish off our 2023 series brilliantly well. So thank you to everyone. It's great to have you at an Atecla Scotland event. I hope we will see you soon. Our programme for 2024 will kick off at the end of January, so look out for it. So I hope you all have a cup of tea waiting because it is still raining outside and enjoy the rest of your evening and hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank You're you. very welcome. It's been a pleasure.